Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Father Tipton. I am currently the chaplain at St. John Paul the Great Catholic High School in Dumfries. But what that means is that on the weekends, I get to play the circus priest, especially in the summer when all the other priests go on vacation. So I hop around from parish to parish to torment you and get you out of purgatory more quickly by having you sit through my homilies, but also stir things up like a crazy uncle and then leave you in the hands of the pastor and not take any responsibilities for what I do. I love my assignment. But I do, I do actually enjoy going around to all the parishes in our diocese. My family, we transplanted in here about the time I started going to college. And so I never really had the chance to go visit all the parishes in our diocese. And this gives me a great opportunity to get to know the parish, not only in, by seeing the building, the beautiful churches that we have, but getting to spend a little bit of time with you. And so my prayer is that today in this celebration of the Mass, we may truly remember that no matter where we go, we are always at home in the church. But I come to you today, we celebrate this beautiful solemnity, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is kind of strange when we look at it liturgically. Because in the church's calendar, when we look at the way that the church celebrates the mysteries of the faith, there are certain things that always hold preeminence. Now, up pretty high up there are Sunday celebrations. The highest, of course, is Easter, then Christmas, and then you have the, priv the privilege seasons of Advent and Lent, and then you have ordered time or ordinary time, which we are in now. But today we have a particular celebration of a mystery of the faith, the Assumption of Our Lady, which trumps a Sunday Mass. As a matter of fact, this is only one of two days in the year where this is possible. Today's feast, obviously the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is one of them. The other one is All Saints' Days. All other celebrations bow or give way to the Sunday celebration. So there's something very, there's something interwoven in the very nature of the celebration that the church is trying to portray or impart to us. This is not just another feast day. This is something that should have pride of place in our hearts and in our minds. We should anticipate this feast day as if it were a Sunday. Now, why is that? Why is the Assumption of Our Lady such a keystone of the faith? Here's why. Let me paint it as a little uh, a separate analogy. The Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary is, in one sense, the greatest of season finales, like the TV shows. When you have a season of movies, we just had the Bad Batch that wrapped up on Disney+. Plus. That was actually a lot of fun. But when we have all these seasons that build up these movies and build up these stories that have characters, that have plot, that have um, situations that keep escalating to the point and where you get the very last episode, which comes with a punchline and yet the hook to keep you going for the next season, today's celebration is that punchline. It is that hook. But what is it? It's the fact that God's, God actually follows through with the promises that he makes. Now, essential to our celebration as Catholics are the mysteries of Christ our Lord, the incarnation, his life on earth, his passion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit. And yet, all of these are there for two purposes— the glorification of God the Father, which the Son, God the Son always does to God the Father. And the second is our salvation. Now, if Christ had done all of his mysteries without bringing any single human person into heaven, it's for naught. It's for nothing. God comes in and makes a great show and then he disappears. But that's not what God does. That's not what Christ does. Today, a human person dwells in heaven, body and soul. We can dig around the Holy Land all we want, but we will never find two corpses. We will never find the dead body of Christ, and we will never find the dead body of Mary. They're not on earth. What Mary has right now is what we look forward to in the resurrection of the body, you 
and myself, we eagerly await this reality which will come at the second coming. But it is a reality that's already given. It is something in which we can walk with great confidence because it's given to one of our race, the greatest of our race. Mary, the greatest human person, is in heaven. Now, I'm using technical language here. Jesus is a divine person, not a human person. Now, he's a divine person with a human body, but it doesn't make him a human person. He is a human. It's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm using philosophy here. It's very minute. But Mary is purely human in every respect. And she, in her body and her soul, is in heaven with Christ. Now, the church lays out for us many of these themes. So if you imagine, if we're sticking with the analogy I initially started with, the um, TV series that has all the interwiving plots and the character developments, if you follow those strands in the different TV series, then the, the, the climax, the season finale, has such a great impact. Our readings today pick up the strands that are part of the story of salvation that we need to understand to comprehend the mystery we have today. Now, for today's celebration, there are two sets of readings, one for the vigil last night, and then the readings we just heard for today's Mass. The readings last night picked up on the strands of a a few key aspects of, um, of Scripture and tradition. The concept of creation, the establishment of God's temple on earth, and the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence on earth with his people. But today we're given three other strands which I will walk through in order as after I explain and list them for you. The first is Eve, the wife of Adam. The second is Bathsheba, wife of David, mother of King Solomon. And the third is the king is the city of Jerusalem. Now, how, where do we find them in scriptures? So we had to first turn to our first reading, which accounts the great sign in Revelation, where a woman appears clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars. This image actually appears many times in scripture, but not always specifically identified with Mary. It is here in Revelation clearly identified with Mary because of, what she, who, what, because of how she's depicted. She is a woman who is pregnant, a woman who is to give birth to the son, the one who is to be the king of the universe. No one in history has done this apart from Mary. But there's another key here that unites Mary with Eve. We get it in our first reading. What, so when this lady appears... In all this glory, there is another sign that appears. It's the great red dragon, the serpent. Who else in Scripture had to face a serpent? Eve in the Garden of Eden. So here we have these two women who face, in one sense, the same enemy and are given the exact same choice. Eve sees the serpent, and is offered the choice to listen to God or to listen to the voice of the world. Now, spoiler alert, Eve chooses the voice of the world. And as she fell, and so too does Adam, the human race ever after their offspring, us, are wounded by original sin because our bodies, our human nature, comes from them who are wounded themselves. This is the condition in which we are born. Mary, contrastly, she is presented by the word of the archangel a choice to listen to God's word or to turn away and thus follow the voice of the devil. Again, spoiler alert, we know what Mary's answer is. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Fiat, let it be done unto me according to your word. And Mary, who follows God's word so perfectly that the word doesn't become just something that's a sound wave that bounces off your eardrum or it's something that she just keeps in the silence of her heart, but it is a word that she hears so perfectly that the word actually takes on her very flesh in her womb and she becomes the mother of God. 
This yes that Mary gives ir- not, uh, irritates is an understatement, but it, it greatly perplexes the great serpent. Because what happens after, we didn't get to it in our first reading, but just after this, the, the, the dragon wages war upon the woman, seeking her out who has been taken away from her. Mary has entrusted herself to God, and she is taken to a wilderness. She's taken to a place of waiting for the son to establish his kingdom. The devil pursues her. He tries to, well, since he's failed to persuade her to listen to his word, he seeks to destroy her. And he does so by spewing forth water from his mouth to wipe her away from the face of the earth. Here, water is not depicted in the Christian sense, but it's depicted in the sense of Genesis, the waters of chaos, the waters of the world, the waters that are unruly, the waters that have no order in it. This is moral and physical evil. But God preserves the, preserves this lady, Mary, from the attacks of the serpent. So Mary stands as the new Eve. She who was given that same choice of Eve, in the same state, remember, Eve, before the fall, was in the perfect preternatural state. She was a complete human person. Mary, who is immaculately conceived, has no sin. And she stands like Eve, shoulder to shoulder, facing the same choice. One turned to the serpent, the other turned to God. And so Mary holds a pride of place of all human persons in all of history because of her faithful witness, her faithful following of God's word perfectly. But we're also given two other images, but Sheba and the city of Jerusalem. And both of these are listed in the responsorial psalm today. This responsorial psalm was sung in a solemn celebration historically when King David assumed his throne and then in a solemn celebration receives his mother Bathsheba and has her sit on his right, a seat of authority, a seat of power, a seat of influence. But Sheba becomes the one of the most powerful people in Israel because she has the ear of the king. What she says goes. If you don't believe me, try saying no to your mother. But Sheba, remember her. She appears in the story of the, the first books of, uh, in the books of Kings when David lusts for Bathsheba while she is bathing on a rooftop in the middle of the day, while David was doing nothing. Idle hands are the devil's playground. Um, King David put himself in such a position that he fell, or he, he presented himself to where he would be tempted, in which he gave in. He gave in to his lust for Bathsheba, and she, he gave her a child, which would be King Solomon. Now we know David does repent, and is restored to God by the prophet Samuel. And in this act of conversion, in this act of contrition, God accepts the fault of David and rather uses it as a plane of salvation. What was this child of sin now becomes the child through whom the Davidic line would continue all the way to Christ himself. King Solomon would be the greatest king after King David. But let's stick with Bathsheba. She who was also a sinner, was given such dignity and power because she was the mother of the king. How much more appropriate is it that the mother of God, who is perfect, free from all stain of sin, from every guile and deceit, from every temptation and every error, would likewise be given the throne to the right of the Lamb to look over the world and to be its intercessor, its guide, and its mother. Mary is the perfect queen. She is given a seat above all human beings because of who she is, a perfect human following God, but also the mother of the Son of God who has claimed the world for himself. 
But we also have this central location of where this all took place. And this is in the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, which has a long history in the Old Testament. It is the, originally, it was the seat or the throne of King Melchizedek, the priestly king, the king of peace, who blesses Abraham in his vocation to be a light to all the nations. Now, it is through the Jews that they eventually come to take Jerusalem, and King David makes it his center seat of power, that kingdom or that city of peace. We all are aware that with Jewish celebrations of Passover, there is that phrase that keeps coming up, next year in Jerusalem. Jerusalem holds a physical, geographical, theological, mystical, personal, psychological center for all Jews because it is the very heart of revelation. It is where God has chosen to be with his people in time and in place. But we all know that through history, Jerusalem has never really been a city of perfect peace. It has been under siege. It has been conquered. And even to this day, is a place where there is a lot of strife, anger, and hatred. Christ comes and he reestablishes his kingdom, not geographically on earth. You will not find his army marching through the streets. You will not find his emissaries going to nations asking for approval or for recognition. You will not find his laws being written on pieces of paper and handed out and posted up so that all may, may follow it perfectly. But Christ establishes his kingdom in the hearts of his disciples in his children. But this kingdom has a particular person in whom it resides perfectly. Once again, this is Mary. For whereas Jerusalem is a city of peace, and in the heart of the city is a temple of God, which is God's presence among his people, so too with Mary, who is the kingdom of God, holds within herself in her womb the divine presence of Christ, who took on her flesh, became man, so that we may all stand as brothers and sisters in his kingdom. Mary is most aptly taken into heaven and assumed body and soul into heaven. It is long tradition of the church that the apostles, after the death of Our Lady, buried her, but then when they went back, her body was gone, replaced by roses. And her body is taken into heaven. She who is immaculate, she who is perfect, she who is queen regent, she who is the, the new Jerusalem, she who is the Ark of the Covenant, she who is the new Eve, she who is the temple of God on earth and in heaven. Now, this is all historical. This is all the great capstone, like I mentioned before, the great climax of the story of salvation. God has accomplished and he has, he's, he has manifested his promises by how he treats his mother. But this also applies to us. It has a future direction for us as well. What Mary has received, we await in hope. And how we can apply this to ourselves is to recognize that all human persons are called to a transcendent destiny. We have a transcendent goal. We are human beings who are both body and soul. Yes, we are born in a wounded world affected by original sin. Yes, we struggle amidst the physical and the moral evils that exist in this world, the waters of the dragon that are poured forth, but we also have a place of refuge in the church, in the sacraments, in Christ. But we are also given a lofty goal where we will reign in heaven for all eternity, and what we experience on this earth will count as nothing to the beatific vision that we are destined to have by following Christ our Lord. We each have had a beginning in time. There is a moment in which we are created in the joint union of God creating our souls and our parents who create our bodies. And in this union, we have our human person, body and soul, intimately twined that cannot be separated by anything else than death. 
That is one of the realities that we will have to face. That is one door in which we all will one day have to pass. Death is something that is coming, but it is by no means the end. Christ has broken the bonds of death. He has given us the ability and the chance to be reunited with our bodies after death, to live in heaven with him, body and soul for all eternity. This transcendent goal of the human person is something that's deeply lacking in our society now. Our society looks at the human person purely from a materialist point of view, that we are just bodily creatures. We are no better than the animals sometimes. There are some people who purport that the earth will be better off without humans because we are the source of evil. What they forget is the human soul, the human spirit, where we're able to have hope, where we're able to love, where we're able to strive for something greater by the assistance and by the perfection of God's grace. But it is also reality that is meant to apply to our very bodies. You may or may not have already been aware, but last week, our diocese has issued a document on the catechesis of the human person. Now, this in particular is in, it's, it's in answer to the growing transgender movement that plagues our society. The idea that we must, I, we must accept everyone for who they claim to be. Now, sentiments of feeling accepted, sentiments of feeling welcome, sentiments of belonging or growing in personal identity are not evils. But when we take it as an absolute, and then when we say that I can claim of who I am because that's the way that I feel, something goes missing. We forget the union of our bodies and souls, that our bodies are good as well as our souls. Yes, they are both wounded by sin, but an answer is given by Christ our Lord. We are to take people's identity seriously, but we are to understand our identity as it is revealed by God, because it's only by revelation that we know that we're made in the image and likeness of God, which basically means we have the capacity to know God and know each other, and we have the capacity to love God and love each other. If we deny either body or soul in a human person, we cannot have this image and likeness at all. Having a material destiny, any good ultimately does not matter because one day we all shall die. And if we are all spiritual beings, then corporeal realities really do not affect us. Sin is not something that we struggle with. It's just something from the material realm which will one day be left behind. We are neither materialists, nor are we spiritualists. We are disciples of Christ. And like Mary and like Eve, we are presented with choosing an option. We follow the word of God, which is life, which is love, which is belonging, which is eternity, which is joy, which is forgiveness. Or we follow the voice of the dragon, which is the, which the only voice that comes from his mouth is the order of chaos, where physical and moral evils plague the world and can only lead to despair and loneliness. Let us today remember that we are called to be where Mary is now, body and soul. Let us give thanks to God for this great union of our bodies and souls into one. Let us bring our sufferings, let us bring our crosses to the foot of the altar and find here the life that Christ alone can give because he alone has won victory over sin, victory over death, victory over ignorance, victory over suffering. Through the intercession of Our Lady, may we, amount, may we climb the ladder to heaven and by her intercession, find hope in Christ, who is our Lord, who gives us our identity, and calls us to heaven as his brothers and sisters.